All right, so Dune Awakening. I've been looking forward to more stuff about this game. Um, I probably didn't, I didn't mention, but I came back. I was on vacation like a couple weeks ago. Like I left the country and I was basically on vacation for like two weeks, basically. Um, so I wasn't really posting much. So right now I'm trying to catch up on stuff. This video is like two weeks old, whatnot. But I didn't see it, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna check this one out. And Dune, I'm interested in Dune because I just started getting into Dune when the movies came out, the, the brand new two movies, the two newest ones that came out. So now I'm like a little bit like, all right, I understand what's going on with this world. And this game is following that, but obviously they're like changing things around a little bit. And it's an MMO. I'm not really big into MMOs. Or no, no, I'll say this. I never got into like an MMO, like heavy. And I'm curious if this might be the first one that might really pull me in. So that's why I'm interested. I would love to get access to play this game early in some form of way. Because I like I like what I'm seeing so far. The, the only thing that I'm concerned about so far with this game is... Oh, that's dope. This is just like the scene from the movie. The only thing about this game that I'm concerned about is the combat. I don't know what that looks like. Like, how's that gonna feel? Because what I've seen so far with the combat, it didn't really grab me. But I like the... I like the idea of everything else, though. ...next best thing, which is, of course, our Dune Awakening booth here at Gamescom in beautiful Cologne, Germany. Now, it's been a very exciting week already with the gameplay reveal at opening night live and, of course, all the streams showing the uh, awesome presentations we had here on our show floor. Now, with all that new content, come a lot of new questions so I am lucky that I will have a few minutes with Joel Bialis later today to hopefully answer some of those questions <laughs> but first things first let me show you around and now Joel and I are in front of the theater this is where the presentations are happening uh, there will be people queuing right there a timer will show them when the next one starts we lucky ones, Joel, get to skip the queue. But once inside, what can people expect? What kind of presentations are those? I mean, we'll be showing 30 minutes of gameplay and discussing and talking about what the game is and yeah, giving people a real live performance of the game. So there will be developers in there answering questions as well. Yes. All right, let's take a look at that. And this is it, the inside of the theater. This is where 63 people can be seated to watch a presentation. What's going to be in this presentation? So uh, we're going to, you know, start with the player's first steps, character creation, of course, but then your first steps on Arrakis. Then we're going to show some building, we're going to show some world events that can occur, we're going to show the sandworm. We're going to end with going to a social hub and showing off one of the city areas of Arrakis. And we're going to show the uh, spice hunt at the end of the game. That's kind of what's going to happen in the presentation. And then afterwards, questions? Afterwards, questions. And I kind of want this screen at home. Uh, honestly, same. Uh, you know, those sandworms look really impressive on a big screen, as we already knew, but yes. it's fun to see it with the game involved as well. <laughs> and for those of you who could make it to Gamescom, there is, of course, or was, of course, an opportunity to still catch all the action from this presentation from our streamer booth. We had streamers like Sacriel sitting down, showing the presentation and chatting to their Yeah, her audience. tattoos are kind of clean, though. Get in trouble if we push some buttons here. I like the colors. A couple. Okay. I'm also going to join a couple of the streams and hang out with the streamers. Oh, sweet. Talk a little bit okay. about the game. What's your game face? What's your streamer face? Oh, I don't know. I've, like never, a... I've never really... Uh, maybe it's like this. Joel, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me for a quick chat. Thank you for having me. So before we're digging deeper into all the new things we've learned and seen about Dune Awakening, how does it feel for the first time to be able to show your game to the public? I mean, it's really, really exciting. It's humbling to see what the public think. Like when you really get it in front of players, people who play the game, like we've, we've shown it to journalists and creators a few times, but this is really like the first look for people who, you know, just play games. You know, 
Will they get into the gameplay? Will they like it? You know, are they seeing what we see, the promise of the game? So you say the reaction of the players, have you just been creeping around the corners of the booth to watch them whilst they play? You're watching people play. You know, like, you know, I'm the guy who stands behind you and kind of... There will be a comment or two about that, coughs, I'm sure. Coughs every time you... It's uh, going to play differently. Wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's left. <coughs> left. You guys came not just, of course, with a, a game to showcase, but also a new tagline. Uh, it's survive, expand, control. What's the tagline all about? Survive, expand, control is really kind of the, the phases that the player goes through on their journey in Dune Awakening. And we've kind of always had this, like we will always use this internally to explain the player journey. Uh, in the beginning of the game, the player is really learning the mechanics of survival, the harshness of Arrakis, dealing with, you know, the heat, learning to find water, you know, avoiding that sandworm and sort of making their way through the world. But then over time, they become more settled. They start to build a base. They start to expand outwards from their base. They build vehicles. They go out into the world and explore, expand their operations. They expand their bases. They make them larger. Maybe they move to a better part of the map that they prefer. And then eventually, once you've sort of seen what the world has to offer, Wait, what did you start I say? buying it, it said not enough. Map. Not enough stability? Is that what it said? They expand their operations, they expand their bases, they make them loud. Not enough stability. Okay. So this one, you're building a base. I mean, building a base is cool and all, but... I guess for, for me, building a base is cool, but like, what can you do in the base that's worth building it? Like, the reason why I mentioned that, because in Starfield, they had an option to like build an outpost. And I mean, you was able to create like a pipeline of, of like some kind of like system to like, um, to basically um, gather materials from planets to basically mine materials, I guess. But that wasn't really that interesting to me as far as gathering. And for example, in Starfield, when you had the ability to, to just own a house or, or, or own like a loft, in like a, some kind of like high rise and it's like all right so i have access to this apartment or whatever and i can put furniture in here but but what's gonna make me want to be here and there was nothing that i can find in starfield that made me actually interested in hanging out in the space that i created i i, I mean for me building a ship was amazing because you're gonna be on that ship traveling across the galaxy so making it look however you want was cool even though the functionality of things inside the ship wasn't really worth paying much attention to, honestly. I mean, outside of the bed, I didn't really, really interact with anything else in the Starfield ship. But yeah, just my point is, why am I gonna build a base? And what can I do within the base that's gonna make it, make it worth being built, you know? Worth me being creative, you know? So I guess that's where I'm at. If, if, if they have mini games, like board games, like let's say I can create like a board game, like a game room, and they have like in-game games, like how other games, like Horizon has an in-game game, or you have you have Gwent, I think it is, and uh, and uh, The Witcher, and there's like in-game games that you can play with other players, and it's like, yo, come to my base, we about to have a gaming session, like. Like you bring like two other people, we're gonna all get together and play this game in my base. And it's like, are right, you having people come over to hang out and like do stuff in the base? That'll be fire. So as long as I have things I can do within the base, as opposed to just like upgrading my weapons or my upgrading my gadgets or my skills, you know, if there's things I can do like activity wise, I think that'll, that'll make building the base and being very creative with how you do it, um, worth spending the time. That's just what I'm thinking. Maybe they move to a better part of the map that they prefer. And then eventually, once you've sort of seen what the world has to offer, you start vying for control over the spice. So you want to start, you know, forming a guild, um, perhaps signing up with one of the factions, and of course, trying to control the production of spice on Arrakis. So it's like a, a bit of a checklist for the player, essentially. Exactly. <laughs> like these you three know, steps and then profit. These three steps, 300 hours later, and you're the king of the world. Easy. It's so simple. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, starting at the beginning there with the uh, survive. We've talked about survival on Arrakis uh, plenty of times before. We, you know, covered worms, war, all the good stuff. We haven't really talked about the sun that much. Uh, can you maybe elaborate on how people can withstand it? Like, what can you do against the sun on Arrakis? Yeah, so I mean, obviously the most obvious thing is travel by night. And the second most obvious thing is stay stick to the shadows, right? So um, obviously the game has a full dynamic day-night cycle. And as the sun moves through the sky, the shadows change position in the world and you want to try and stick to where they are and do your activities in the shade. Now that isn't always possible. So you start to craft yourself gear like steel suits, which allow you to you know, resist more heat um, and of course preserve water. And you start to craft yourself um, like steel tents, which allow you to like have portable shelter in the world. All right, so those oh, okay. still tents and distilled tents, is the, the, that the something tents. I can craft myself? Okay, yes. so I've seen that in the movie. In the game. You, you, part of the journey that you go on as a player is you go through these trials of Akul, which are kind of a Fremen ritual. And at the end of those rituals, you learn recipes that the Fremen have prepared for their own survival in the desert. And you as a player can then start to craft those items that you picked up, yeah. Can I, for example, also build buildings and use their shade to hide behind? Does that work? Yes. Okay, sick. Yes. That's actually really cool. Yeah, it's actually kind of fun. It's also like sometimes you'll be out harvesting, right? Yeah. And there'll be a rock that's casting a shadow and you'll be like, oh, I'm just going to crouch behind the rock before I shatter it yeah. so that I don't actually, you know, get sunstroke. Smart, smart. Okay. So use the environment yeah. to your advantage or create environment for your advantage. And everything's also. kind of dynamic, so it's nice, yeah. That's that, that's really, I mean, that's generally just so much joy because everything on Iraq is, is so dynamic, like the sand, the movements, the, the imprints you leave whilst yeah. walking on that sand as well. That stuff is interesting. And then there's, there's like other layers to that where you can use like certain devices to blow away the sand because you're looking for buried treasure. Things that get deposited by sandstorms, they leave treasure in their wake that you can actually, you know, find hidden beneath the sand. You need a scanner to find it and then you can, you know, dig up the treasure. It's kind of cool. Just things like that that the tech technology allows us to do. That's really cool. Such an interactive open world to explore for all the players. Uh, now, another thing we got to see more of during Gamescom is building and the process. We, we talked about blueprints a little bit, about the collaboration of building. I want to dig a little deeper into customization. How customizable are those buildings? Well, I mean, so we have multiple different building sets, right? So the one that we've shown most of the time in these trailers is the, uh, the Chome building set. Chome being kind of this organization that mass produces things in the world. Um, and so you start with the basic building tiers. And then over time, you can upgrade into more fancy versions, which have different visuals. And you have things like if you join the factions, you get access to the Atreides you know, building set, the Harkonnen building sets. And these kind of allow you to visually customize how your base looks, right? And obviously Harkonnen is very HR Geiger, very dark. And the Atreides is more like fancy castle kind of stuff. Can I mix and match? Yes, you can combine those in any way you like to create some really weird hybrid combinations. That can get very messy, can yeah. it? Okay. It can look very can... weird. But hey, that's, all, that's what customization is all about. You want people to be able to express themselves. Exactly. Expression and customization is one of our pillars. So express yourself however you like, even if it turns out that your Harkonnen Atreides hybrid is an abomination to mankind. Another thing which has been coming up a lot more uh, during what we've seen here at Gamescom is the presence of spice. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we've seen uh, two different types now, flower sand as well as spice. Uh, how do you harvest that? What's the difference between the two? Yeah, so a part of the, the kind of mechanic of the game is drawing people out onto the sand where that sandworm is, making their lives a little more risky, a little more dangerous. Flower sand is this soft sand it's mentioned in the books is a place where the fremen like to pitch their tents because it's the softest place to sleep it's kind of this very fine grained sand you find on the the most exotic of beaches or arrakis yeah or arrakis <laughs> in this case it's very fine grained sand and in the game you need it as a resource for crafting so you can go out there you can harvest this flower sand by hand it takes a little while to harvest a lot of flower sand that way um or you can use this really cool tool we have called the static compactor and when you fire the static compactor at the ground it kind of takes all the sand and lumps it together in this big pile for you to just harvest straight away. That sounds like something that makes noise though. Yeah, it does, right? And when you make a lot of noise on the sand, <laughs> okay. you start to attract the sand one. Okay. So I guess this is like the sandworm, like, like warning, this little red thing. Okay, that's a sandworm coming to eat you. That's a small sandworm. Yeah, 
so these are kind of the mechanics you use for harvesting flowers. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. And then later. Wait, wait, what was that? All right, so I'm, I'm wondering. So these. Did they did they purposefully like slow down and pause this part, or did you just slow down your vehicle? I'm like, why is the sandworm just like posing? But I'm, I'm guessing they probably just slowed it down and stopped it for the video. But this is kind of cool. The set, the sandworm, it didn't look that big um, up close, but I guess when they put his whole head out, it looks pretty pretty huge. But then again, I remember hearing that they do have like smaller sandworms. And then I guess in certain areas, that's where they have like the real big ones that can like take down an entire like, like um, remember in the movie they had that, that huge um, spice harvester that was like the size of like a damn building that was driving around. And then the sandworm swallowed that thing whole. So I guess they have like the real, real big ones somewhere in the game. But I guess these are like the smaller ones that'll, that'll pull up in like, I guess, smaller locations, I guess. These are kind of the mechanics you use for harvesting flower sand. And then later on, when you get to spice, it works functionally, it's quite similar in that the big spice blows leave giant spice fields on the sand. And you kind of harvest in the same way. You can harvest by hand. You can harvest with a static compactor. And of course, you want to bring, you know, to harvest the most, you want to bring a sand crawler, dump that on the surface and use it to suck up as much spice as possible. And naturally, all of these things take place on the open sand and the sandworm always comes. Okay, is there, is just there a big, big one. Uh, from being around the spice for too long whilst harvesting? Like, can I, am I inhaling the spice? What is happening to me? Yeah, so, so just by virtue of being on Arrakis, you're inhaling a lot more spice than you probably would if you didn't live on Arrakis. Factual, and, uh, yeah. and we see that in the films as well, happens in the books. Um, and so, yeah, as a player, if you, if you stand around on a spice blow too long without proper protection, you start to inhale too much spice and it gets into your bloodstream. And, and that can lead to, let's say, certain effects on your character in the world and in the game. Yeah. You know, the idea of these, uh, these visions that Paul has, I think, is an interesting thing. We're definitely exploring this kind of idea in the game. Um, what it is and what it means, I'll, I'll leave for the players and their imagination. And hopefully one day they'll find out. <laughs> Noted. Um, now that I harvested all that spice though, what's, what's the main usage for it other than the personal use? Like why am I out there harvesting and, you know, um, I mean, risking my life for it, really? Sure, I mean, in the books, the Fremen use spice for everything. It's, it's, it's something that became a huge part of their culture. And in the same way, the player also starts to sort of find multiple uses for spice all the time. Um, you need spice residue for fueling some of the generators in the base. You start using spice to craft almost anything mm. in the world. Like some of the higher tier gear in the game really requires spice as a key ingredient. You use it to pay your taxes to the emperor. To pay your taxes. Yeah, I have to pay taxes in this game too. This is how we this is how we claim a sub fee. Can't, can't escape it, man. Can't escape those taxes. I mean, you can, you don't have to pay them and then you get killed by the Sada car and try that's to fight unlucky. the but that's, that's, yeah. that's an option you have. Okay. Um, and then of course, <laughs> If you want to go into the lands radar, spice is kind of the primary currency of the kind of political infighting that's happening between the major houses. And you can take a large role in that. And of course you can sell it to make a lot of money. So it's spice, it's everywhere. Spice is the backbone of everything. It really is. Um, okay. uh, another thing that uh, we saw in regards to spice or even like touched on in previous episodes was abilities as well. Um, is there anything you can share about the connection between spice and abilities? Yeah, so as, as the player's blood gets saturated with spice, you can m imagine how abilities might be altered by being able to see just a little bit into the future. And so, you know, we have some of those effects in the game. I won't, again, spoil too much of it, but yeah, it's, it will have an impact on your abilities. Fine, I'll take that. That was an answer, we'll take it. It's an answer. It's, it I can't go too far down that path. Um, well, speaking of abilities, though, uh, it was really, really exciting to see some new abilities showcased here at Gamescom. Uh, Shield was one of them. Can you maybe talk a little bit about adding new abilities, your philosophy when it comes to creating abilities okay. uh, and make them work in your world? Sure, we have, I mean, so first of all, we have our different archetypes, right? And we try to maintain our consistency with the lore of who those people should be. So if you, if you, you know, are a Mentat or a Trooper, it's kind of like your basic set of abilities is kind of aligned around what that archetype would be using. So, you know, right. your basic set of those people should be. So if you see what this you, is, you know, our men. So this is like a skill tree, I'm guessing. Mentat or Ability shield wall, deploy a dart proof energy field generated by the Holtzman effect. 
Level up this ability to increase lifespan. To increase the lifespan of the ability being up, basically. So cooldown, I'm guessing that's 23. Is that 23 seconds? Okay, I'm guessing the cooldown is 23 seconds. And the duration that the wall will be up is 10 seconds. Okay, so if you level up the ability, it'll increase the duration. Cause that'll be the, the duration will be the lifespan, right? So maybe the next I guess these these this levels is one of three. So I guess maybe level two would be like 15 seconds, maybe. Maybe level three would be 20 seconds. Okay. Okay. Map, inventory, crafting, technology, skills, journey, customization. Uh, I, lo I love the fact that you can respect the ki the skills tree. I love games that allow you to do that. Just give you the freedom to do that. I think that's dope. So you don't you're not stuck with whatever decision you made, even if you don't like it. Or a trooper. It's kind of like uh, ability hunter seeker, pilot and assassins remotely controlled needle tipped drone. Okay, I remember that from the movie. The cooldown is sixty. I'm guessing that's sixty seconds. Your basic set of abilities. Uh, battlefield calculation used to scan of nearby characters and objects okay we've seen that in the trailers we've seen that in the trailers enemies will show their archetype and traps will show the damage type they deal okay level up this ability to increase the duration so right now the duration is 60 seconds wait so why did the other things say lifespan and this one is saying duration like, what's the difference? Is there a difference? Cool down 20 seconds. Okay. So after you use it, you can use it like another 20 seconds after. Okay. Abilities is kind of aligned around what that archetype would be using. So, you know, Mentat, human computers, being able to see and calculate information really quickly in the world. But then from a gameplay and fun perspective, we're trying to build a game that has combat that is about getting in close for melee combat and then yeah. pulling. Yeah, what took him so long to shoot you? Like, was he not sure if he was an enemy or not? He was just aiming. He been saw him. I don't know why he took so long to shoot. Back quickly to go back to range. So you're always Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. I gotta see something. Hold on. I gotta... Yeah, because I, I said combat is something that I'm concerned about with this game. Uh, so let me see what that looked like. I wasn't really paying attention to how From he attacked From a gameplay and fun perspective, we're trying to build a game that has combat that is about getting in close for melee combat and then... You hmm. Like he, he did like a, a dash forward, uh, like jump knee attack, but I don't know it, it, that knee attack. It felt real. It felt it, like it looked like it didn't really connect. Like he just like bumped into him, kind of like you know what I mean. Like it, it didn't feel like it didn't, it didn't feel like it had any weight. Like it had any weight behind that hit play and fun perspective we're trying to build a game that has combat that is about getting in close for melee combat you know what i mean if it kind of felt like empty calories right there i, I didn't that, that that knee strike it felt real it didn't feel like it really like i ain't like the thud like i ain't like that hit like i like the sound of it it didn't sound like it really hurt or the way the the, the he is he's falling forward like the fact that he rushed him and did that knee attack he should have fell backwards i mean instead he just he's just falling in place like you, you see like he didn't like he didn't like oh crap and got hit and like fell back a little bit you know what i mean and then we hit the ground maybe some dust came up off the ground like he hit him but he just fell and he just fell straight down we're trying to build a game that has combat that is about getting in close for melee combat like see if you run and hit somebody like that with that much like momentum running forward and then dashing forward with a high knee kick shouldn't they fall backwards he, he just fell straight down so that's the only thing i'm concerned about with this game i'm really concerned about the combat is it gonna feel good you know what i mean because if the combat doesn't feel good then then what are you going to be doing if you're not feeling good with the combat like there got to be something else that's going to feel good if not the combat right so that's the only thing I'm really concerned about with this game, the combat. And then pulling back quickly to go back to range. So you're always switching your tactics based on the enemies you're... So... Ooh. 
and then pulling back quickly to go back to range. So you're always switching your attack. So he's shooting this character right here. And the, I'm guessing the bullet is hitting him, but he's not responding as if he's getting hit. He's not like his body's not moving, like he's getting shot. Based on and then eventually he just, I guess he just hit him enough times to where he dies. But he wasn't responding to the to getting shot. Like, am I bugging for pointing that out? Is that like odd for me to point that out? I, is this like a normal thing for MMOs or? If it's normal for MMO, like I said, I don't play MMOs like that. So if this is normal for MMOs, then I'm just new and excuse me, you know? But if this is not, I'm just looking at it. I'm just, I just find that to be just a little concerning for me coming in. That's all. On the enemies you're fighting, if they're wearing- Cause I want, like, I want the combat to feel good. You know what I mean? I want it to have some weight to it, you know? Bring shields. Then you need to get in there and attack him with melee. Ranged attacks just won't do do the trick, right? So it's it's kind of really about this uh, push and pull, and so our ability design. But but visually, I like the way the game looks. I like the whole idea of what they're saying, what they're trying to do. But the combat it just has me, you know, the, it just has me. The combat has me on the fence right now. It's really about giving players options. Whether Look, that oh oh the knee charge. That's the move that he just did. The knee and charge. And so our ability design is really about okay so the knee charge hold to aim and release to jump forward with a knee attack okay so we just saw him do that deals concussive damage and heavy staggers the target cost stamina level up disability to increase damage but yeah when he did that the enemy it was a small enemy it wasn't like it was like a big brute the enemy looked like it was his size if not smaller and that enemy didn't fall back they just fell straight down so i, I found that to be kind of odd giving players options, whether that is about getting you to them as quickly as possible, that is things like the dash ability, getting you in really fast, or using a shield. Okay, that one looked better. That looked better, it looked like he fell backwards. I mean, he still fell somewhere in place, like his foot is still in place, but it looked like his head went backwards at the very least, so that the animation looked a lot better for that for that attack. Bigger wire claw on the environment to pull yourself close to the enemy. But also giving you abilities okay like voice so, so traversal like that looks cool pull the enemy and okay that, that looked better the voice to walk to you so that they can be struck down by your blade so it's okay. kind of about combining these things and our ability design really takes this to heart how do we get people in and out as quickly as possible so with the traversal abilities i can really kind of pair that with items and, and, and tech right yeah so i mean of course we have the suspensor belts which basically at their lowest level of lay to fall without taking damage but at okay. their highest level of lay to fly basically freely without with you know obviously power drains over time but suspensor belts really allow you full mobility in the okay. air I'm essentially the baron at that point yeah exactly, okay that, that's right? cool exactly. that's cool and, and that's the fantasy um and then you can in combine your fantasy those. is to be the baron so oh, i need you know, to I've, stop you i've right been working there. on it for years okay <laughs> But um, no, so the 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 Wait, yeah. The, <laughs> did he just call himself fat? <laughs> like you know the Baron in the movie, he's like a big heavy set guy, the ball guy, heavy set, and he's like you know, you know what I mean? And then he just touched his stomach when he did that. Okay. And then you can in combine your fantasy those. Is to be the Baron, so oh, I need you know, to I've, stop I've right been working there. on it for years. Hey, it's like, yeah, he just called himself fat. <laughs> but um, no, so the the the. Yeah, the ability to like use suspensor belts to fly around, right? And then combining it with a sugar wire claw, using the momentum of both of them to pull you through the world, you know, twice as fast as you could normally okay. move. Okay, I like or, the traversal. You know, using the dash into a suspensor belt, which allows you to like really go quickly in the world. It's kind of crazy and we might need to tone it down. But that sort of stuff is like, it's super interesting to see. And that's kind of what we mean by our combined arms. It's like playing around in the sandbox with the way that the combat, the abilities. Yeah, like, kind of like see that? Like if, if I'm... With the momentum for me to jump forward fast like that and knee Playing somebody in the back. It's like playing around in the sand. Like they shouldn't fall straight down. Like they should be they should be falling forward. Or especially with that momentum, maybe even fly off that damn cliff. Box with the way that the comp When you push it when you jump into somebody like that at that speed, that momentum, they shouldn't fall straight down. Look how he falls. Like they shouldn't fall straight down. They should be falling forward. I know I can't. I'm not crazy for thinking that, right? There's no way I'm crazy for thinking that. Just off of this momentum, just off of physics. So, I mean that 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 turns me off. This that turns me off just a touch. You know what I mean? Because it it, it kind of pulls me out of the immersion 
when something like that happens. It just pulls me out of the immersion a little bit. You know, that's all. Abilities. All these kind of things come together to just make combat feel really dynamic and interesting. Uh, there were a lot of interesting things, obviously, throughout the last few days here at Gamescom that were shown uh, during, uh, you know, the opening ceremony and also the things we see here on the booth. Also, we got to uh, get more sneak peeks into, like, the player hub. So we got to see a sneak peek of an allegiance ceremony, for example, but that's something that you shared in the past that people do not have to align with one of the houses. That's still true, right? I, I do not have to get involved in yep. any of that. It is true. You as a player do not have to join one of these factions in the game. You're not forced to join them. You can play the game as a lone wolf or like with your little clan or guild of people who don't want to be part of the major faction, but you'll okay. always kind of end up interacting with them in some way, right? The Harkonnen and the Atreides are fighting this war of assassins over the planet's surface. And in some way, your contracts and the way that you work in the world, you're always going to encounter them in some form, but you don't have to join them. You don't have to be one of them. You can maintain your independence. You can help people who are participating in the Landsrad, but you don't have to be aligned necessarily with either of those groups. Now, I mean, I do think it's a bit of a shame to miss out because sometimes if you don't join, for example, the Atreides, you won't be able to get up, get their best gear. You won't be able to get, you know, all of the a building set, for example, that the Atreides has, and you'll definitely miss out on their cool Awoo battle cry. Okay. <laughs> but, but, Shout out to Discord. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Discord. But the, um, but you know, it's completely up to you as a player, and you will be able to buy things like Atreides outfits that other players craft and put on the. Oh, the blueprints. Uh, yeah, I can, yeah, so like I can that. still so get my. People can put things out for you to buy. Yeah. Okay, so the the major drawback of not aligning with uh, one of the houses would just be that I'm missing out on like specialized items. Yeah. House in, in a way, house and, and, and I mean, I think some of the the cooler pol political story stuff that we're putting into okay. the game as well. Is, yeah, so it's, like, it's interesting, but you don't have to do it. The main story is not tying you to one faction or another. How, how, locked, in, uh, how locked in am I? Like, can I still play both sides in a way? Is there a drawback? Once I'm tying myself to Atreides, well, what is, uh, then well, one day I wake up and I'm like, new day, new me. I don't want to be this anymore. I'd like to like, go it, join the Baron. Exactly. Yeah, no. <laughs> what, what happens then? Can I leave? I mean, yeah, of course. It's June, right? You, of course you can backstab people and oh, certainly okay, an option. <laughs> so okay. you can go down that way if you really want to get those rewards. <laughs> of course you can betray your solemn oath to the to the Red Duke. You can do that. I, I don't think he'll look kindly on you after that point, but you definitely have the option. I have my reasons, I'm okay. sure, or will have my reasons, rather. <laughs> okay, so there's benefits and advantages and, and a few drawbacks there, whether or not I want to align or get involved politically. <laughs> Got it. Now, last but certainly not least, I think one of, if not the biggest announcement was, of course, a release window. Early 2025 is when players can get hand on the game all over the world. But before that, will players get an opportunity to play more in the beta? Will there be a bigger beta, more open beta? What's, what's the spiel? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Like we're, we're still doing our persistent beta that we started a few months ago. Uh, we're letting in more and more people over time. Uh, and we're going to start boosting it in a big way, adding lots of people to the beta in the coming months so that we can really test our server robustness, our scaling, and of course, things like our end game systems, which we really need a lot of people to help us test out. So. Yeah, it's a great time. Hopefully people have already wishlisted the game and signed up on JuneAwakening.com, but if they haven't, Sign up for still the beta. plenty of opportunities to get your hands on the game and make a decision about whether you like it or not before we launch I it. I feel like I did that like Absolutely. a year well, ago. Joel, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm going to release you back into the wild to look at what the players are playing outside right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm <laughs> going to go and be nervous and try not to tell people how to play my game. You're doing great. <laughs> And that's it from our very special episode of okay. Dune Awakening here at Gamescom. As Joel just said, make sure nah, to she, she, she did and good, bro. Course, she asked a lot of good questions. She asked at Dune Awakening. most of the questions that she and asked were questions that I would have asked. Don't forget to also join our Discord 100%. server and join the conversation. It's been she so asked much a lot fun of good to be questions. here and have a look around. And of course, I want to thank you all so much for tuning in once again. Next time, we'll be back on Arrakis, so we hope to see you there. Yeah, she asked some really good questions. Um, I like... I like seeing people that are like doing interviews that are like actually like a, a person that would play the game. Like they're not just doing their job. They're like actually interested because if you're interested, you're going to ask interesting questions. You're going to ask questions that they're going to want to ask, you know? So I like hosts or interviewers that ask questions that the person that they're asking the questions to are excited to answer 
you know I think that's a big reason why a lot of people like watching hot ones because Sean Evans he'd be asking questions that his guests don't normally get asked and they get excited to answer the question because they feel like okay this host is actually locked like they actually like tapped in with me based on the type of questions that they're asking and she sounds like she's really excited and she asked a lot of really good questions um coming to pc early 2025 and then playstation and xbox release date to be announced i'm gonna play this on pc i'm not gonna play it on xbox or, or playstation so I'm not, i don't really care about that but early 2025 that could mean any time between like january and april i'm guessing right so it could be it could be a february release it's possible um but yeah, the only concern that I have about this game, literally the only concern I have is the game, is the um the combat. The combat, it looks, it looks um like it's missing. Like, I'm not gonna lie, ragdoll ragdoll physics can make a big difference in a lot of games like ragdoll physics if you jump and knee somebody from across the room they should they should be falling backwards they should be especially like the way he's doing it they should be off their feet flying backwards don't have to fly like 10 feet but they should be falling back and tumbling hitting the ground for at least two or three feet you know what i mean at the very least two or three feet they should be stumbling backwards hitting the ground they don't have to they don't have to be knocked out they can get back up but they should be you know what i mean and i think that'll make a huge difference in the way the combat feels if you're doing melee attacks um so i mean that's all i have to say about that but i'm still interested to see what else they do in this game but still the combat is still uh a slight concern now, I never played any game from Funcom before, so maybe that's the norm for the combat to look like that. And maybe that's the norm for all MMOs. Maybe this is a big leap in MMOs that I'm not familiar with. Like I said, I don't play MMOs. This would be this would be the first one if I was to play it, which I'm interested. But uh, I don't know, y'all let me in the comments. How does that combat look to you? Is that combat, is that normal? Is that, is that above normal? Uh, is, is, that, is that like, progress in the right direction um is there another game that's an mmo that has way better combat i should pay attention to or view to kind of compare the two or is this like you know what i mean it's just nothing to worry about like, like let me know all right so i think i watched most of the videos that i care to watch for today so i think i might be good for today um i was gonna watch the the trump and Kamala Harris thing but um I don't know I think I might just leave it at that for today nice little 40 minute video 